Uh, right. Hi everyone, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about what I'm doing in Lysol currently and to do that I will start kind of from afar, uh, basically giving a brief overlook of what is cosmic microwave, uh, microwave background, what part of cosmic microwave background we are planning to look at and why radio photography is important. So cosmic microwave background has oh, oh yeah, sure. uh, has first been detected in 1965 by Pentes and Wilson. This has been a monumental achievement in our understanding of uh, the galaxy and the development of the universe, obviously, because it's um, was uh, very critical to throw out a few uh, theories about how the galaxy developed. And each new discovery uh, related to cosmic light background is uh, effectively uh, similarly important in our understanding of the earliest uh, years of uh, the universe. Because for this, um, for you know the earliest results, which did not uh, have a lot of detail and basically just was a, a detection that something is uh, radiating from you know, way back in time. Uh, that was important for our understanding of inflation and impact theory and everything like that. But currently the theories are way more elaborate than the case of the same. So the reason why cosmic microwave background exists in the first place is uh, is because the uh, speed of light is finite. So essentially, uh, if you we could look far enough in the universe, we will essentially look far enough inside because the further we will look in the, in the galaxy, the further back inside, and, uh, you know, whatever the events are uh, happening. You you might know this from the fact that. Uh, the stars that we are currently observing are essentially millions and millions away back in time and might already be you know, blown up, but we want to know about this. Uh, and by extension, you can actually look at the earliest years of the universe, so just looking in between the stars and looking at the background. Um, yeah. uh, this is a schematic of what that looks like. So, yeah, we essentially have a way of knowing what happened uh, 12 billion years ago, which is why, uh, in my opinion, it's extremely impressive. Um, and our current uh, maps of uh, cosmic background have uh, begun with uh, results obtained with the COPY satellite and WM, and the latest uh, results. Of the distribution of the microwave background that has been uh, obtained with the Planck uh, plan satellite. Uh, and something that you might already notice is that this uh, radiation is not uniform, it actually has some. So the temperature distribution is actually a few hundreds of millikelvin, uh, you know, less or more from the average. It depends on where you look. And that is one of those things that we can use to make some theories about how the universe hurt. Um, yeah. Because the cosmic microwave background that we actually observe uh, is um, basically this imprint of the state of the universe from you know, about one million years since the Big Bang. Uh, and the anisotropy in this uh, is essentially intensity distribution. Yeah, sure. Yeah, for example, what is microwave background? Yeah. Oh, so from? It is just microwave radiation, uh, essentially. Um, on, uh, it's uh, like a radiation on uh, the temperature of, uh, I think it was on this first slide, about 7 like, Couple of Kelvin, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, and we can we can just detect it with uh, radio telescopes if we just look between uh, the subjects. 
Um, yeah. And so, and this isotopy, as I mentioned, is indicative of the state of the universe uh, one billion years since its development. But once uh, photons actually have the ability to scan so into the throughout in space, uh, past the combination stage, uh, when there wasn't a, I think before that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not yet, I don't yet have uh, a good enough grasp of this you know, development of the universe uh, stages. But I, I think before that billion years mark, uh, when the universe was essentially in a positive state, we couldn't really get free uh, propagation of light. And as soon as that free propagation was Possible because of the recombination of uh, three electrons with uh, atoms. Uh, that's when we start to see this sort of pattern. Um, yeah. So apart from the isotropy, apart from these non regularities in uh, the intensity in, that are caused by different temperature and are essentially indicative of different density of uh, matter, different points in the universe. There are also isotropies in the polarization in the cosmic background. Uh, background. Um, and that is caused by a few things. Um, but one of these things is primordial, or well, essentially primordial emos, but um, what that essentially translates to is uh, polarization caused by primordial gravitational waves. Uh, which is something that is very important in, uh, you know, finalizing our theories about the earliest years of the universe. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the uh, other parts, but something to take note of on this slide is that if you look at the uh, numbers beneath, um, the actual amplitude for normalization for this B moment part is about three times smaller than the systematic errors in the parapolitics. Uh, so the state of the art right now is that it's actually very difficult to get a good enough image of this uh, B mode polarization that is indicative of gravitational waves. And this is something that we're trying to remedy in this project. Um, yeah, to, so basically to clarify all of this separation into B modes and E modes is uh, basically uh, when the initial scattering of this radiation that contributes, yeah, contributes to cosmic microwave background happens, um, it essentially consists of uh, wave scatterings of these three electrons. Uh, so, all the cosmic microwave background is a product of Thomson scattering of three electrons. And whenever you get this combination of radiation from hotter spots coming from one direction and radiation from colder spots uh, coming from 90 degrees but in you know, a perpendicular direction you get a polarized light that is you know, uh, scattered into the direction of the vector product and this is the source of all the polarized light in the cosmic microwave micro background of all this polarization that we see and this polarization is typically separated into so called E modes and B modes. Uh, the way I learned to understand this at the moment is that e the, if you map out the polarization of the entire sky, uh, you can separate this map of polarization into a curve free uh, field and into a gradient free field. So the curve free field is essentially the map of the uh, E mode polarization and the gradient free field is a map of E mode polarization. And these two actually differ in the sources uh, because E field polarization is just uh, polarization that are, that's produced by acoustic waves uh, in these earliest years of, uh, you know, of the universe, just uh, some contraction and expansion. Uh, and because we get these areas of colder matter sandwiched between hot matter, you 
get the linear polarization test. Uh, however, to get this B log polarization, I'm not going to get into the specifics, frankly, because I don't understand them myself. Yeah, myself. Well, uh, the B log polarization is specifically indicative of uh, gravitational waves in this early universe. Uh, however, the problem is the polarization from the gravitational waves is in polarization is much weaker than the emo polarization. So while we uh, have known that there is this linear polarization for a long time, emo polarization, and if I'm lucky, it will be the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> has only been detected a few years ago. So uh, this result right here uh, from the BICEP2 collaboration, it dates to only just 2015. So we've only known for sure about this. Beam polarization is actually a component in the CMB uh, only for much, about eight years. So this is a, uh, an extremely fresh area of science. Okay, and just a bit of justification for some slides uh, further in, in, in my presentation. Uh, basically, um, the gravitational waves are not actually the only source of beam polarization, but actually a couple more, such as the synchrotron radiation in the universe and the scattering of the cosmic dust. Uh, however, these are not sources of the beam polarization in the cosmic background. These are sources in the foreground. So, obviously, but you know, polarization happened way, way after uh, the earliest. Uh, moments of illness that we're trying to look at. So, part of the problem with trying to discern this beam of polarization is actually separating it from this, you know, uh, cosmic microwave foreground, these foreground sources. And to do that, it's actually very important to not just sample the background on a single frequency, but on several frequencies, because these uh, foreground sources actually have a different frequency dependence and the uh, black polarization of the uh, cosmic microwave path. So, uh, because of that, it's very important to uh, get us wide of a range of frequencies in our data source. Yeah, and this is just to kind of underline all the things that I already mentioned. Uh, yeah, so because it's so important for looking at the earliest years of the universe um, and because there's so many technical challenges in actually doing that, uh, beam of polarization uh, has been the focus of a few uh, next generation uh, experiments in uh, astronomy. And one of these experiments is the Simons Observatory telescopes. Um, here I'm showing just a large action telescope, but if you look at the corner here, there's actually three smaller ones. These are located in Chile, uh, in the middle of Atacama Desert, and yeah, they have a sort of uh, scientific goals apart from looking at the, uh, you know, the part of cosmic microwave background that uh, has information about gravitational waves. But, um, but, you know, the scientific goal that I'm sort of working towards is actually improving these systems uh, to actually uh, allow uh, this detection of uh, evil polarization. So, yeah, uh, the telescope itself consists of a couple of mirrors uh, placed in a cross dragon pattern, if I remember correctly. Uh, then I, uh, I can't count them. At the moment, but a few optics tube, separate optics tube, and each optics tube is this long cylinder, um, huge long cylinder as well. Uh, so you, you can see that here's the detector part of the telescope. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. a bunch of optics tube inside. Uh, yeah, and each optics tube consists of a bunch of lenses. A bunch of cryogenic uh, stages to actually allow cooling to cryogenic temperature because obviously we have very low signal and we want to uh, have as low temperature of the temperature lines as possible. 
and um, actually getting into color graphing out. Uh, I think about this system is, is that they can obviously be modeled uh, by our uh, instruments to allow uh, simulations of all the systems before they actually build. But to get a really rigid understanding of the performance, uh, it's obviously best to test this optics tube uh, you know, in the lab experiments. And this is where holography comes in. So holography is basically just taking this optics tube and measuring it outside of the telescope, just in a single prime start, by uh, placing the source where the detector is and uh, scanning the field at the aperture of the optics tube. Uh, once that is done, uh, the field at the aperture of the optics tube can be just projected uh, onto one of the mirrors here, or one of the parabolic mirrors. And what that allows to do is, from this reconstructed field on the mirror, uh, you know, the guys who are building the telescope can uh, tell how much of this radiation uh, in the detector comes in from points that are you know, not accounted for. So obviously we want to try to avoid uh, some radiation from, you know, from the edges of the mirror perhaps, from some points not on the mirror at all, getting into the socks, since it's the top of the reciprocal. If we get uh, an idea of where radiation from you know a source place of the point in terms of where the sensor one will be. Uh, if, if we get a sense of where that shines, we can just you know reverse that and get an understanding of where is somewhere unaccounted unaccounted for a radiation coming well, once this whole thing is the thing is operational. Uh, and yeah uh, uh, I didn't mention that but this also involves scanning the complex field so the amplitude in the phase uh, of in the aperture of our system. So, one of the systems does exist already and has been used to test the amplitude for this large aperture science observatory. Um, however, uh, it only operated in the frequency range of 90 to 180 megahertz. And one of the things that we are trying to do right now in Iceland is uh, first, recreate a system like that, and second, try to push, uh, push it further into higher frequencies. Um, yeah, and you can see here, uh, basically, the idea here is that we get a low frequency signal, we uh, multiply the numbers with a harmonic uh, mixer, uh, get it through this optics tube, through all the lenses, filters, and whatnot. Plans uh, go there, uh, then the, the, this whole thing is uh, done, uh, brought down in frequency by another harmonic multiplier, and read out with an FPGA collaborator. Uh, yeah. And that's the way we get this from this uh, amplitude that is needed for solar version. So, for instance, one of the important things that was able to be done. Uh, from that whole uh, experiment, from that whole set of measurements, is that they realized that um, because of uh, a particular filter in this optics tube, uh, they got a, a whole bunch of radiation uh, way above the, you know, the spot where uh, it was planned to get all the radiation from the mirror. And so this experimental uh, testing of the optic tube has led to you know, uh, quite important changes in the design, which I assume would have not been caught with just computer simulations. Okay, uh, so yeah, actually coming to the CMB project that I'm involved with, um, as I already mentioned, uh, the, one of the goals of the project is a couple more is using a similar facility for testing this sort of optics tube in the University of Iceland and pushing them into high frequencies, so up to 400 uh, gigahertz and then use that facility to 
test uh, of 6 cube on several next generation uh, CMD experiments. So, apart from Simon's Observatory, uh, it's also planned to uh, use this developing uh, facility to test the uh, for Taurus and Lightbird satellites, which also look at cosmic Lightbird background. Uh, anyway, actually coming to what I'm doing at the moment, uh, one of the things I've been working at for the past four or five months is trying to figure out how to use the assembly uh, mounting CC, which allows to combine the time domain and integral solver. Uh, because that is something that I think because um, the extremely high frequencies that I being used here uh, make it just about every you know a part of that system optically rather large, but the uh, toys itself are obviously optically comparable in frequency. So yeah, I've been trying to combine ten domain integral solvers to try and uh, simulate parts of the system before actually getting to infinity. And I meant to say that uh, if anyone uh, here actually has some experience in using this assembly, assembly mode in CST, uh, I would greatly appreciate, appreciate any any advice you might have on you know, that only starting to get into. And I assume that maybe uh, someone uh, at the department who have already worked with it previously before. Um, another thing I did is figuring out this uh, FPGA, which is basically, yeah, uh, or Parasol, uh, which is basically an FPGA with embedded RF uh, capabilities. So, yeah, uh, this can be used for a bunch of different things, a uh, bunch of uh, system defined radio adjacent things, but currently I'm just using it as a shitty uh, spectrum analyzer. And maybe if I get a software, so I can get a uh, downgrade this vector analyzer as well. Uh, so far, I just used it to look at the Wi Fi signal in the lab, but the plan is to actually get it into, so if I scroll back to the schematic, to actually get it over here and get it to cover it uh, signals. Uh, basically, there are two signals that are being read here, one that is passed through the optic suit and one that just gets uh, modulated up, um, multiplied up and then downwards, and then uh, their difference is used and actually make the uh, biggest field maps and the uh, plan is to use this FPGA in some other way to uh, uh, the guys who work with science and stuff can use. Yeah. And the third thing is uh, yeah, working with the newly built anechoic chamber. So since about a month ago there is an anechoic chamber in the University of Iceland. Uh, it's not exactly a typical anechoic chamber because we are working with frequencies of 400 gigahertz, and I'm assuming megahertz isolation is not as important. So it's not as well isolated as a typical anechoic chamber, uh, but we, I'll try and characterize it anyway to see how well it can be used for different terms. Um, right now it's just anechoic chamber itself, but in the future, in about a year or half a year, but it's also going to be a cryostat there as well to actually um, test the optic tubes uh, at regime uh, temperatures. Yeah. And that's it for me uh, for today. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, yeah, I'll be looking forward to this. Uh, yeah, I, I just figured it would make more sense to. I have a question. Uh, it was very interesting, but I didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I can go rush to the actual technique. Yeah, I, I want to ask you what the main, main idea of this method. I want to understand what uh, the 
uh, microwave background, what, what uh, temperature um, in, in this, uh, I don't know. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. And okay. actually the reason, uh, I probably didn't mention it or didn't pay it. All right, thanks. Well, so this method of photography has been used for quite a while, actually, to test uh, optics of the telescopes. Um, however, one of the uh, new things uh, in photography is actually project photography. So before it was mostly warm photography, so testing these optical components at room temperature. Uh, but since recently, there has been a, and because like because of how faint this signal from beam uh, polarization is, and uh, the signals that we are looking at, um, because uh, how faint it is. We actually need to push way further in sensitivity, and that requires a much better understanding of how the, all the different optical components perform in the final experiment. And the final experiment, obviously, is uh, cool down to project temperatures. So, this uh, new idea is to actually test the components at project temperatures from the get go and not just test them at room temperatures and then hope that they will perform the same way. Um, and the photography itself, like the idea of the photography itself, is to basically test um, how the, like, which parts of the telescope the optics do uh, samples by um, instead of like, having the detector where the detector would be, uh, the sensor um, placing the source there and radiating in the opposite direction right? to, to see how, you know, which points in the telescope actually uh, radiate back into it. Uh, we are kind of following the propagation of the wave backwards. It's more understandable. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. Uh, it was uh, like uh, the first part of the presentation where you showed uh, the maps of uh, temperature of the uh, backgrounds and so on. And uh, you said that uh, I suppose it was uh, the difference uh, from the mean value. Yeah, yeah. I actually got confused by this for a second where I was yeah. talking about this. It's, 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 it's a delta. It's not just an absolute temperature, no. it's a difference of temperature. Uh, but uh, how the mean was evaluated? Um, so, what is it? Is it? Actually, I actually don't know. Uh, okay. okay. But uh, what uh, this map shows, what uh, this map can show us. Uh, so, uh, so uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, a polarization component of it, uh, but you know. Uh, arises from these differences in density, but obviously based on intensity, uh, and it's also that also arise from this same differences in density in different parts of this early universe. Uh -huh. So this essentially shows us um, which parts were hotter and which parts were colder, uh, once the universe just started to attack. And uh, by colder and hotter, you mean that uh, we like, somehow into so it's, as uh, uh, that directly leads to the how much uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. How much it to be it? Hmm? How much it to be it? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So the, the positive uh, difference is like more, and uh... so yeah, it, it's like um, either a given part of the is hotter and it radiates more strongly, or it's colder and it radiates more. And yeah, from this uh, from distribution of this hotter and colder parts, or from the distribution of polarization, the uh, constraints on uh, Various variables that they used in creating theories on the exact scenario of its early development of the universe, which I 
он где здесь сказать, про что такое It's like the intensity of the signal from space on this frequency. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, I also have questions. So you had to start. I don't know the number. But, uh, because I want any of this. So as far as I understand, the transmission of the signal uh, depends on the frequency. There is lines from hydrogen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This one probably. Yeah, so as a, as a correct understand, this is like a, a, a spectral a spectral form of the. It's transparency of the atmosphere, from what I understand. So, and what it does it mean that zero millimeter emission to all the So, so what, what does it mean the different curves? So, I'm not particularly sure, to be honest. So, because it's interesting, why? <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, but I don't know. 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 Why this telescope, which is in the Atacama, why they don't put it in space? Because it's so, they do put it in space. What? Well, well, uh, um, and uh, actually, I might have been wrong here. No, I, I think both of these are satellites. But it's also, um, I might misremember something, but things like these two at the bottom are satellites. Um, so they, they do obviously make some measurements from space as well. And there's also, I think it's Taurus. I think it's Taurus. If the light part is a satellite, and I think Taurus is actually not a satellite, but instead of being that we put on a kilo, like a large, of the balloon and actually launch it to the stratosphere, so mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, opaque uh, parts of the uh, atmosphere that actually uh, interfere with uh, measurements from a uh, you know, light base telescope. Mm -hmm. so um, I'm guessing it's just easier to make a larger telescope on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the reason that you see these Yeah, but there are still problems with this. Yeah, 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 yeah but. I, I guess the bad things are when you're all from the cover of these windows of transparency, you can probably get a much better resolution mm -hmm. and uh, install. I, I guess the rotation of the rooms is not Probably the, the biggest benefit is just to make them larger yeah, so um, for, for the cheaper cost and the way they talk. Yeah, Bonus slides, guys. Sorry. Uh, two hours. Yeah. Um, I just want to stop recording so that it's not in the Uh, I, I don't know. Is, is it okay? Uh, no, but it's just recording. But it's okay. We can probably make up. Yeah. Open the slides.